Welcome to uh, the GPOD's Global Policy, Diplomacy, Sustainability Info Session and Open Lecture with Her Excellency, Ms. Maria Basols Delgado. Uh, she would be joining us in some time. The reason why we're all here together uh, and the reason why I have to uh, spell out what GPOD stands for, uh, for all of you is because I'm assuming a lot of you are new and some of you are interested in our next cohort. And uh, this is that time of the year when we want to uh, want all of you to engage with us before we select our final cohort. So one of the things that we're really looking forward to through this discussion is piquing your interest in GPOS, letting you know what this is all about and why one should go ahead with this fellowship, but also to make you realize the potential that each of you holds, uh, make you realize the potential that each of you could hold uh, with two specific uh, tools that GPods provides to you. Now, there are wonderful, wonderful things that have been said about GPods. We were recently uh, nominated for the United Nations SDG Impact Awards as well. And there are a lot of things that we'll be covering during our uh, talk today. But there are two specific things that I want to take you through before we delve into the whole discussion about the Global Policy Diplomacy Sustainability Fellowship. So right at the beginning, what is the Global Policy Diplomacy Sustainability Fellowship? GPODS, as it is called, is basically a three-month virtual, everything's online, fellowship. And it's quite literally a fellowship because you're joined by people from across the globe, uh, from across professional backgrounds, from uh, across professional uh, strata at which you stand, from different age groups. So there are a lot of segments of fellowship that we explore during uh, the GPOS fellowship. So it isn't just a lecture series that you attend over the three months and learn something new and go back. That's only one part of it. The other parts of it, as we'll uh, take you through during the presentation, are how you all get together as part of this GPOS community from people across the globe getting to know people who might not be within your professional realm as of today. And uh, when you think of them, you might think that you've kind of hit a wall as to what do I do with this network? But as you go ahead further into the GPOS fellowship, you'll be connected with so many individuals uh, who will help you explore your profession and academic pursuits going forward. So that's just the tip of the iceberg about the GPOS because I've only explained the fellowship part to you I haven't yet got in, got gotten into the GPODs part of this, the global policy, diplomacy, sustainability part of it. And there are a few things that are very, very noteworthy about this fellowship. The first thing is, when I ask myself, what is the difference between me of 21 year old, 25 year old, 30 year old versus me of 50 year old, 60 year old, there are two main differences that come to mind. One is the academic knowledge that you kind of conjure through your professional careers, right? So when you were, say, 15 or 16 versus you of today, there is a lot of knowledge capital that you've gathered about what you're interested in, right? It could be sustainability, it could be policy, it could be international relations, international political economy, uh, comparative public administration, global commons, all of those things might come into the picture. But that's only one aspect to it. The other aspect to it is between you of today and you of 10 years prior, there's a difference of the network that you have. You know, you know more people. You know people who will help you with your professional pursuits, academic, academic pursuits, your friends and peers who help you, encourage you, guide you towards wonderful things that you're doing in your life. So all of those things are adding to your uh, professional pursuits that are happening today. And GPODS kind of rolls all of this in a three month fellowship and delivers to you to our best uh, uh, capacity to make you leaders of tomorrow. Now that's at the very basic of, of GPODS. As we will cover during the presentation, and I hope some of you uh, have questions about this and we'll be happy to answer those as well. Sustainability or 
climate change, climate action, climate mitigation, environment, environment law, policy, circular economy. Similarly, public policy, when it comes to public administration, comparative public administration, things like the game theory, things like some systems design thinking, and then international relations or international political economy or diplomacy. None of these in today's times function in silos. All of them are very fluid and all of them are more and more dependent upon each other. So you cannot today achieve sustainability without knowing how to change the policy or how to, you know, uh, make other governments believe that this step is the right step. One that is more suited to you, but also to the whole planet. So there are variations of international relations and there are variations of policy and there are variations of sustainability that flow into each other and out of each other. And these are some of the things that we, that, that is at the crux of the G coalition. So as we take you through the presentation and as I'm joined uh, by Arpit Chaturvedi, let me quickly introduce myself and then we'll move on to Arpit's introduction and we'll take you through uh, the G4 Fellowship. So I uh, am an environmental lawyer by qualification. I, I am an energy, I hold a master's in environment and energy law and policy from Stanford University. I was a rising environmental leaders fellow. Uh, do not ask me when, it was quite some time back. I have worked for the United Nations Economic Commission for Europe. I worked for the United Nations headquarters. And now uh, I run an environmental policy think tank along with Arpit. Uh, and with this, I'll move on to Arpit, and Arpit would quickly introduce himself, and then we'll move on to what GPods is all about. Sure. Hi, everybody. Uh, great to be meeting you here. And uh, my name is Arpit. I head a think tank called Global Policy Insights. Uh, we work on <clears throat> international political economy, uh, governance, and sustainable development, and we are based out of India, New York, and uh, London. Uh, I also uh, have co-founded an environmental consulting firm and we are doing some great work uh, along with Ishan. It's called Envipol. And uh, I'm the co-director of the GPOTS Fellowship and I teach a course over here called Comparative Public Administration that I've also taught at uh, the San Francisco State University to graduate students over there. And uh, looking forward to be interacting with you today. All right, great. So guys, uh, let me first tell all of you a couple of pointers, which are the most asked questions and, and they're on our FAQs on our website as well. Who can become a GPOTS fellow? And we are going to go through our fellows and it'll become clear to you that we have a very open mind when it comes to the GPOTS fellows. But there's, a, there's, a, there's an objective that we're trying to achieve through the GPOTS fellowship, which is creating a community of global leaders who can effectuate change going forward. That could be in public policy, that could be in sustainability, that could be in IR, it could be in data analytics, it could be in mathematics, it could be in something completely different. But these are the building tools to effectuate any sort of important change globally. So who can become a GPOTS fellows? Fellow, we've had anthropologists, we, we've had scientists, we've had mathematicians, we've had environmental lawyers who I have a soft spot for because I'm an environmental lawyer myself. We've had public policy professionals, we've had politicians, we've had bureaucrats, you name it and we've had them. And the reason and military why, leaders. And military leaders. And the reason why we have such a diverse group of people joining us as fellows is because we really <clears> want GPODs and we've uh, to a large extent achieved this objective of making GPODs a cultural melting pot but not just a cultural melting pot. It's also a melting pot of knowledge base. It's a melting pot of professional backgrounds where different people coming from different professional backgrounds blend into uh, this, this leader of tomorrow and exchange their knowledge while also seeking knowledge from others. And that knowledge flow is at the heart of GPOTS. And as I take you through the presentation, it will become clearer to you. Uh, again, as we're talking about who can become a GPOTS fellow, let me also right at the outset, uh, let all of you know, and we'll discuss this later as well. We also believe in diversity of age. We yes. believe that to provide a perfect environment, we want people who are just starting out in their career <clears throat> or people who are still studying for that matter, because they're the most innovative of us all. I think all of us could agree. And we want people 
who are 20 years, 30 years into their professional backgrounds because they know the currency of experience. And when you, as a GPods fellow, interact with your peer who's been in this profession for 30 years or interact with your peer who's just about to start off in the profession, you'll realize there was a lot of chasm between what you have been doing and what you could do and what you will be doing. So those are the things that we want to address right at the outset that who can become a fellow. And we'd be taking up uh, all the questions that you guys have uh, at the end of this presentation. Uh, but let me just quickly kick off this presentation then. So I have been talking a lot about what this, this beast is about and let's get right into it. As I explained to you, GPods is uh, not that creative a name. It is quite literally an acronym for Global Policy, Diplomacy and Sustainability. This is the heart of GPods. As I explained, policy, diplomacy or international relations and sustainability or environment, climate change, climate action mitigation cannot work in silos anymore. They are fluid and GPods gives you all of these the tools and equips you with tools in all of these spheres through this three months virtual fellowship where you can build off on your knowledge of diplomacy or on your knowledge of policy and even if you have none you can build up your knowledge of diplomacy and policy and sustainability through not just the lenses of that particular faction but through various factions that we cover so that is gpods in a nutshell but I assure you there's a lot more to it than just the acronym that I have described to you. So I think uh, this is quite self-evident, but as I explained to you, public policy. So I, let, me, let me take you back to the 1950s and I don't want it to become one of my lectures that I do take for the global seminars series on sustainability for the fellowship. But let me take you back to 1950s. Uh, in the 1950s, medicine was the profession. Everyone wanted to become a doctor and everyone wanted uh, to have the basic degree, which in the UK and, and Commonwealth nations is known as MBBS. It might be called something else in other parts of the world. And then something happened and people realized that, you know, if there is a heart to it, why don't we specialize in the heart? People became cardiologists. If there are nerves to the human body, why don't we become neurologists? If there is a kidney, why don't we become nephrologists? And we are at the precipice of that happening to public policy, We're at the precipice of that happening to diplomacy, to sustainability. So public, public example is not just limited to public policy, what you and I understand. It is a lot more about public policy of elections, public policy, policy of conservation, public policy of uh, democracy, or the lack of it. A public policy of changing systems in a way that you do not limit yourself to the municipal government of your city or state or town, but also you bring on uh, issues like how do you merge systems that work efficiently for the economics of that town, right? So it's not just making sure that everyone has clean water, but how can everyone benefit from that clean water? How can uh, they can, how, can you find a way in which the economics of clean water will merge into that? And that's, as an example itself, shows you how public policy will merge into sustainability. And that's why uh, the study of these three factions is so important in today's time. But again, diplomacy, if you take as an example, and I do not want to take any uh, specific names of any specific states or countries, but you can, you can see water diplomacy playing out in real life. You can see waste diplomacy playing out in real life. You can see uh, forest diplomacy playing out in real life. How when certain fo forests are cut, the whole world is, is at stake. The health of the whole world is at stake. If you take the buzzword of today, and, and if, if I may, uh, the most cringe word, worthy word of today, all of us have heard a lot about it. All of us somehow, somewhere fear it as well the coronavirus diplomacy as well, right? How is this working out in real life? How do international relations get affected by this? How do you merge public policy in a way and leverage the sustainability that has happened due to uh, the coronavirus pandemic and the lockdown that ensued? So all of those things are just an example of what we cover. 
and a minuscule example of what we cover during the three months online fellowship. So uh, at, if at any point of time, Arpit, you want to add something, please do jump in. But that's- Certainly, I mean, I was just thinking about your uh, example related to water diplomacy. And I just thought that, you know, okay, uh, if we think about this problem that, you know, we want to provide more water to uh, people, let's say in, uh, you know, the northern, uh, northern part of India, which is, uh, you know, uh, let's say towards China, or let's say, you know, that region of India, which borders near Nepal and China both. Now, what do you do if you want to provide more water in that region? Uh, a, it's a public policy challenge because, you know, uh, places around that, the groundwater is running out. So you need, uh, you know, you have to think of various ways as to, uh, you know, are you going to ration water? Are you going to, uh, you know, uh, incentivize rainwater harvesting? Or are you going to dig up a canal? If you're going to dig up a canal, then that becomes a issue of diplomacy uh, again, because China uh, has is an upper riparian region over India. And, uh, you know, if the water is coming from there, then you need to uh, figure out a way to get into a diplomatic uh, understanding with China on as to how you're going to do it. And eventually it becomes a sustainability issue because if you're digging up a canal or, uh, you know, if you're putting it on a dam, then, uh, you know, there are sustainability concerns to it. Uh, similarly, at the local level, uh, you know, when there's a, uh, when you're switching from uh, one source of water to another source of water, that has its impact on, uh, you know, uh, life on land and uh, a number of other sustainable development goals. So just one problem, uh, you cannot look at them in silos. And, you know, one thing that we talk about is that uh, you cannot look at public policy as something that is typically taught in a public policy program, wherein you, uh, you know, think about urban policy, you think about educational policy, you think about rural development, et cetera, et cetera. You have to link public policy with things. And all of these, they do matter, but then... <clears throat> you have to link public policy with sustainable development and diplomacy. And only then do you get the real picture of any problem that you're solving. So that's the reason why we decided that we want to work with people who want to understand these three disciplines and who want to understand the interactions and intersections of these three disciplines. So that's the broad idea behind this program. Correct. And, <coughs> and uh, there, let me also clarify that uh, GPODs, fellows are not required to have any prior knowledge about these disciplines. So while, Certainly. You might, while you might have some sort of uh, uh, knowledge or know-how of any of these disciplines, but you're not required to have them because the idea is to, to start every course, start each of these journeys that we take with a single step, and hopefully we'll be able to cover the thousand steps by the end of the three months. So a uh, thousand miles, I apologize. Thousand steps would be too, too short a name. So, Going forward, what do we do over the three months? We have basically divided this whole structure into three factions. And there are a lot of other elements to it, to which we'll come to in a bit. But these are the three major elements of our fellowship. The first is we teach three courses. Now, each course is 20 hours each. The first course is comparative public administration. And we'll talk about each of these courses in more detail in the time to come. The second course is Global Common Seminar Series, where we talk about things that are happening in the climate change sphere, things that are happening in the climate mitigation sphere. In fact, uh, you'd be surprised to know that about half an hour back, we were uh, uh, sharing a, a guest lecture space with one of, the, uh, uh, one of the primary drafters of the Paris Climate Agreement. And the fellows were quite enjoying that discussion. So those are the lengths and breadths of courses we cover. So that's the global common, common seminar series. And the third is the seminar series. Uh, the third is the international po political economy course, which is basically the diplo diplomacy aspect to it, the international relations aspect to it. So those are three courses. I'd, I'd repeat again, CPA, Comparative Public Administration, Global Common Seminar Series, which is the sustainability faction, and the international political economy uh, course, which is the international relations and diplomacy faction. Each of these courses are 20 hours each, and we'll be discussing what all we cover in each of these courses so that you have a fairer idea of where you would be uh, headed if you do take these courses. So 
up, apart from these, we have five workshops lined up, and I'll I'll let Arpit take over when it, uh, for these workshops. Uh, but we realize that experiential learning is is not just learning from experienced professionals, but also how things turn out in real life. So that's why we have this provision for five uh, workshops for our GPOS fellowship. Sure, uh, and so if if you look at the structure broadly, uh, think about you know put yourself in our shoes and uh, just think about what we want you to leave with at the end of the day, and what we essentially want you to leave with are three things. One is knowledge about uh, public policy, diplomacy, and sustainability, and that knowledge building can take place in these courses that we have over here, and. Uh, all of these courses, uh, you know, we'll discuss in detail about them, but then they are either taught by graduates of some of the top universities, uh, Ivy League universities, uh, Stanford, uh, Oxford, Cambridge, et cetera, et cetera. And they are designed and benchmarked with uh, the courses that are taught in, you know, we, we did a survey of many courses uh, in these fields. And then this is almost like a super course that we created by weaving them together. Uh, now, the idea is that you receive knowledge from the courses, you receive skills from the workshop, and you receive exposure from the mentorship and networking from the mentorship lectures. Uh, the idea over here is that, you know, you cannot just be successful in your profession or in your fields with knowledge alone. You cannot be successful with skills alone, and you cannot be successful with exposure and networks alone. And you need to have all three of them to be an effective professional and to bring about some meaningful change in the world. Uh, we'll talk a lot more about the workshops and uh, the mentorship lectures because uh, you know those those are kind of the uh, you know fundamental pillars behind this fellowship. Uh, but then let's let's quickly talk about the courses over here. Uh, you know, there's as Ishan rightly mentioned, we have the comparative public administration course, and this is. Uh, the course that I teach, it is a course which is focused on methodology of public administration. And you know, the broad question behind this course is to understand that why doesn't a particular policy that works in one place works in another? So let's say if there is a, you know, a healthcare response uh, or a public health infrastructure that uh, may seem to work for a country like uh, the UK with their NHS and things like that, why would the same uh, sort of a program and the same sort of infrastructure not work in India? And what would work in India? And how do we learn from each other? So that's the broader question that my course uh, seeks to answer using some qualitative comparative methodologies based on set theories. The second uh, course that's taught by uh, two dear friends of mine, uh, Jonathan Cummings, who's from Cornell University, and uh, Neha Divan, who's from Cambridge. Uh, and in fact, also now Jasmine, who's from uh, London School of Economics, they uh, seek to answer a number of things. A, what do we do with the great power competition uh, between US and China that's happening? How does it impact other countries? How do some of the international relations and international trade challenges tie in with issues around sustainability? Uh, how do international players act with each other through uh, global organizations, multilateral institutions, et cetera, et cetera? What's the logic uh, and what's uh, the culture that exists in some of these institutions? So those are the kind of things that the International Political Economy and Diplomacy course uh, teaches you. Uh, the Global sem uh, Common Seminar, uh, Ishan, would you want to talk about that? Yeah. So. Uh... Global Common Seminars <clears throat> on Sustainability, Health, and Climate Change is what I teach. And as I uh, as I discussed earlier, what we try and do, and it was it is very important for all of you to understand that we do not assume that you have uh, the know-how of how you know electric grids work or how cap and trade and carbon tax works. That's not where we start off. We start off with quite literally defining what the term environment means. And then we move into the environment ethics approaches. Then we move into environmental policy. And then we move into, you know, more uh, hardcore subjects such as, you know, what do you do to mitigate climate change? What are risk assessment systems that are available? Uh, how does it merge into public health? And does that have a bearing on where we're heading as a, as a society? 
and those are some interesting concepts that we do deal with and on that journey we go through uh, things like the paris climate agreement uh, things that are happening in your neighborhood and mine uh, things uh, related to things things related to things that are not in our neighborhood so what's happening in brazil or what's happening in in ethiopia and what's happening uh, with the venison dam all of those things are are covered uh, in terms of our understanding of environment in terms of our understanding of how global commons really work in terms of how circular economy works how how mining is such an important concept of raw materials and without raw materials you would not have an economy but those raw materials are forever destined to be raw materials if you do uh, transcend into circular economy so while this sounds quite a mouthful if you were a fellow and if you had attended the lectures this would have made absolute sense to you so those are the kind of challenges that we undertake uh, while uh, discussing the scores of global commons and our series on sustainability health and climate change uh, arpit you had something to say yeah i i uh, want to talk about the workshops and the mentorship uh, now because uh, i think we have about 35 minutes left before the ambassador joins in so we should also have some time for the q and a but then workshops they they are the really interesting part and uh, you know uh, it relates to uh, a <clears throat> trip that ishan and i uh, took right before uh, the covid you know the covid world hit us and uh, this was uh, at the world economic forum in davos where we uh, were co organizing an event on uh, education for the future and this was the time when we conducted a number of stakeholder consultations there were a number of panel discussions that we co organized and what we learned uh, was that the skills that uh, various civil societies governments uh, private sector organizations all of these uh, stakeholders are looking out for and the, uh, and they believe that these are the skills that are lacking in current professionals and these are the skills that would be more and more important going ahead in the future especially with a lot of work being taken over by uh, ai and being automated these are the skills that would be extremely extremely important no matter what industry you're in and the top skill that we uh, learned was extremely important was the policy writing and communication skills so if you're able to write well write coherently write convincingly and communicate your perspective and your argument well then that is a skill that uh, would take you really really far then another uh, you know uh, thing that uh, ranked high up the chart was sustainable economy and climate change and this is not just a body of knowledge it is a skill because you have to practice a way of thinking uh, when you're uh, you know dealing with things such as circular economy uh, you know how how does sustainability uh, marry economics and how do you make decisions which are sustainable so that's a huge skill that uh, you know ranked high in our list the third bit was complex problem solving and for complex problem solving <clears throat> what we do at the gpot fellowship is that uh, you'll find yourself going through a battery of public policy sustainability and diplomacy case studies and uh, valentina uh, who joins us who takes the series of workshops uh, is fabulous at you know uh, first teaching you some of the frameworks that are important and uh, you know these frameworks are unique to public policy as a, a way of thinking a lot of times what happens is that case studies and frameworks etc cetera, etc cetera, you do even i see in number of places in public policy schools are eventually business case studies and what we do over here is that we have hand picked case studies which are absolutely absolutely focused on public policy problems and <clears throat> they bring in a, a logic which is important for public policy uh, professionals to understand and grasp so things like you know something's not happening because there's politics it's not working but a public policy professional has to make it happen and has to take politics into account and see what to do about it to make change happen so those are the things that you uh, you know understand in this case study uh, workshop series and then you have systems thinking which is uh, again related to complex problem solving how do you understand <clears throat> the nature of the animal that you're dealing with how do you understand unintended consequences that you do x and you think that uh, you know x will lead to y but then x also leads to z and z is not something that you want 
So, uh, you know, systems thinking is a way of thinking more holistically about the problems that we are facing. And finally, a skill that's going to be extremely important is fundraising. Uh, fundraising is something that, uh, you know, no matter what field are you in, no matter whether, you know, uh, you're working a job or you have your own business, something you will have to learn. So, yeah, I, I see Cherry has raised uh, his hand. Uh, so, Cherry, do you want to unmute yourself if you have a question over here? Okay, Cherry, whenever you can, if you want to unmute yourself and ask us a question, please go. Sorry. Okay, I think it was by mistake. Yeah. All right. So uh, going going <clears throat> ahead. So uh, we have covered courses. We've covered workshops. Let's move on to uh, one of the most important aspects of the GPORTS Fellowship, which is the mentorship aspect of the fellowship. Now, as I mentioned right at the beginning, it's not about the knowledge capital that uh, the you of today versus the you of 10 years back has gained, but also the network that you have developed in your academic pursuits, professional pursuits, uh, whatever it may be. And while we give you the absolute best of everything that is available within the sphere of sustainability and policy and diplomacy, we also wanted to give you that network through this fellowship. And what we do is, uh, we have global leaders and for the next cohort for which applications are open currently and the early bird deadline is on the 15th of April, uh, we have over 45 global mentors who work in these fields of policy, diplomacy and sustainability and co I'll come to who some of these mentors are. Uh, they will be coming in and speaking with you about their life experiences, about their expertise. So. They will deliver a guest lecture and you'll learn from the actual global leader in that space. But that's not all when it comes to mentorship. Guest lecture is only a section of it. The other section, is, the other section of it is the office hour that they provide you. So think of it as Arpit uh, quite rightly puts it. Think of it you're having in, into how you're having a coffee, a virtual coffee with someone over your laptop. Uh, you during the office hour, you can, it's a non recorded discussion. So you can not hesitate about asking about your profession and public queries that you might have profession and uh, personal queries that you might have. Uh, and you can also learn from their life experiences, or you can come to them and tell them that, you know, this is what I want to do 10 years later, how, sh how should I do this or tell us about how you have achieved what you have achieved. That's absolutely the world is your oyster there. So you get to develop your one-on-one -on -one, one network through these office hours, which is a luxury that we didn't have when we were in your position. So that gives you a foot in the door of actually being in circles that you aspire to be five years from today, 10 years from today, 50 years from today, or maybe 10 years uh, previously. So that's a wonderful uh, idea to not just promote experiential knowledge through the guest lectures, but also the kind of networks you develop uh, through these global leaders who come in and speak with you directly about their life experiences. So uh, it, we've had uh, mentors from all around the globe and some of them are on your screen. Uh, Ms. Tanya Goner is, is uh, the chairwoman of GIZ uh, and Mr. Stefano Gucci is the chairman of the International Association of, uh, for Water Law. Professor Christina Void, Dr. Christina Void is one of the primary drafters of the Paris Agreement, as I was talking to you a little while back. She ha held an office out today. We have Dr. Mariwala, who is uh, an incredibly, incredibly successful uh, uh, water professional and also on the board of uh, Mariko, the, the corporate. Uh, we have uh, Ms. Elizabeth Rima. Uh, we've had Ms. Elizabeth Rima, who is the director of the Center for uh, Convention on Biodiversity Secretariat. and. For those of you who are environmentally inclined, you know how important biodiversity is for our subsistence. And similarly, we have more and more mentors and I invite you to visit our website and I'll put the link of the website on your uh, chat box and check out all the mentors that we have. Arpit, if, if there's anything to add here. Yeah, I mean, uh, a couple of things on the mentorship bit. First of all, about the mentors, this time, uh, you know, uh, if you go to our website and look at the mentors in the list of uh, summer 2021 mentors, you would see a number of uh, really interesting folks, right, from uh, people who are working with 
the United Nations systems, two people who are working with NATO, uh, some of the people who are uh, you know, ex-ministers or advisors to, so for example, one of the mentors who's coming in is the advisor to the defense minister of Finland. Uh, people who are heading the Philip Morris Foundation, people who are heading the, uh, you know, who have headed the Volkswagen Foundation. Uh, similarly, you know, uh, people from uh, top corporates, these, these are also some of the mentors that we have this time. So you'll see, uh, you know, a great mix of leaders who are coming from uh, the fields of international relations, public policy and sustainability. And, uh, you know, the idea over here is, that you develop close bonds with them. And that's the whole idea behind, you know, uh, they, the mentors come in, they deliver their lectures. But then later on in their office hours, that's the place where you actually get to build your rapport with them. I was really happy when, uh, you know, one of our uh, fellows, uh, Saeed, who has, uh, you know, been working in the uh, water, health and sanitation policies for, uh, you know, many, many years now, uh, caught up with... Uh, Mr. John Dixon, who uh, has set up uh, World Trade Institutes in Japan, Okinawa, in Afghanistan, etc. But they caught up in Pennsylvania. Similarly, uh, we've had fellows who uh, have had, you know, uh, impromptu meetings or alumni meets in Mumbai or in New York and, uh, you know, various other places. So the idea over there is to build a community of like-minded folks and community of folks who can you know, open a lot of doors for you and introduce you to new kinds of information. In fact, there's good research uh, that uh, is available. You'll be able to read that people who actually make a lot of difference in the world and who are able to, you know, <clears throat> rise up the leadership hierarchy really soon in this world, uh, they do have very meaningful networks and networks which are not just transactional, but then networks which go deep, which are diverse. Because if you have diverse networks, you get new information in place. In fact, we've had fellows who found, uh, you know, good projects, good job opportunities. Some of our fellows, they started, uh, you know, working on uh, with our mentors on special projects. And then later on, our mentors wrote letters of recommendation from them uh, for them. And they got into, you know, uh, some of the top universities in the world. So the idea over here is that, you know, the mentors and the, fe and the fellows, they eventually become like one family. And... <clears throat> The good thing right now is that right now for at least our initial cohorts, we are allowing members of all of our cohorts to not just be part of your own cohort and interact with the mentors that you might have right now, uh, but then you can also attend all of the future cohorts or future seasons of the fellowship for no additional uh, you know, fee and keep building because every time we have about 10 mentors who are constant and the rest of the 40, they keep changing or rest of the 35, they keep changing. So anybody new uh, that comes in as a mentor at GPods, uh, you can over the years keep expanding your networks. And I always say that, you know, if you're in uh, a top-notch university, you'll probably meet one uh, really influential pe uh, person per week. So, uh, you know, at an average, it's like you're meeting 52 people in an year and we uh, make you interact and not just interact build deep connections with people of that stature uh, around 50 of them in a three-month period so <clears throat> that's the kind of value that we bring in and then uh, you know coming to our fellows uh, fellows are also they come from <clears throat> various geographies uh, various backgrounds we have had fellows from <clears throat> india from israel from uh, Germany, from New Caledonia, from, uh, you know, Australia, uh, then Sweden, uh, Nigeria. So a number of countries uh, from where our fellows come from, Italy as well, over there. Guys, uh, you, might, you guys must also excuse us uh, because it's very difficult to remember all the fellows, uh, their geography, <laughs> but we are better with names, I assure you. And Certainly. <laughs> I, I invite you to check out our fellows page on the website if, if you're interested in knowing them. Also, feel free to reach out to uh, them or to us directly, but also to them to uh, learn about their experience here in the fellowship. Yeah. And as uh, Ashan so, said that all of these fellows, they come from very different backgrounds. You know, uh, they could be engineers, they could, you know, be current students, they could be people who are coming in with 10 or 15 years of work experience. So you'll see people from all walks of life coming in and, you know, uh, learning something of value at GPods. 
All right. So quickly, a uh, uh, little about <laughs> what has made GPods possible. Uh, now, I hope by now you have a fair idea of the length and breadth of the fellowship program, and and such an extensive, interactive, engaging program could not have uh, been done without uh, the support of our uh, absolutely incredible partners. Uh, so Envipol, uh, the Environmental Consultancy Policy Think Tank, is one of our partners. So is uh, Global Policy Insights, which Arpit is a director of. Uh, we have the International Union for Conservation of Nature India as one of our partners. We have the Global Young Leaders Academy uh, as one of our partners. And we have the That's the Associated Network for CSOs and NGOs for South-South Cooperation. Uh, this is essentially, uh, you know, uh, an organization uh, which is a part of the United Nations Office for South-South Cooperation, and uh, they are one of the uh, backers of our program. And similarly, like GYLA, uh, this is a, a fairly interesting program that takes place uh, across the year, though, but then their flagship programs uh, take place at the World Bank and the UN headquarters. And I'm told that when Justin Trudeau was uh, a youngster, uh, Justin Trudeau uh, used to be part of this program as well. And I've attended this program, super fascinating. So uh, it's only with, uh, you know, uh, the good graces and the good offices of people who are in these organizations that uh, we are able to do this fellowship. You can follow us in uh, all of these social media channels. I uh, am pretty sure that many of you are already following us. I do interact with a lot of you on Twitter, on uh, LinkedIn, even Instagram every now and then. Uh, but feel free to follow us, feel free to write to us directly, and we'll be more than happy to take these conversations forward. And we do really think... Uh, we, we do hope that you'll apply for our fellowship program and uh, you know, we'll be able to create a solid community for solving some of the really, really hard, wicked problems that we're dealing with uh, right now. And with this, our chat box is open and uh, we are more than happy to uh, take your questions and uh, discuss whatever you want to discuss with us. So uh, guys, while you put in your questions and, and we, we will be answering uh, almost all of them, given the fact that we have enough time, uh, let me also tell you a couple of things about the fellowship uh, element of the GPODs fellowship. And uh, when we were talking about partners, I must also confess that we, we do have uh, various international events during the fellowship, including, the, so we had one with the Copenhagen Business School uh, last month, and we have one with uh, the Institute for Environment and Research, the Environment and Re Research Institute uh, uh, on the 17th of April. So we keep having these international mixers where our fellows interact with uh, either fellows or students or professionals from another industry or uh, another institute. And that is also feeding into the networking element of, of the fellowship. Apart from this, we organize international events where uh, fellows, our GPODs fellows get to speak. So they're the front and center of it all. Uh, this includes events like the New York Climate Week event last year. It also includes the UN uh, Habitat Urban Breakfast event that we had. Uh, we also hold an international ideation summit, uh, which is going to be held on the last weekend of April. Uh, so last weekend of this month. And we will be happy to circulate invitations for the event to all of you. So there are a lot of other partnerships that are developing and that will keep on developing when you have such an engaging audience and such an engaging group of fellows that we have. Uh, and so and on, those, on those events, uh, you know, uh, let me just uh, underline one feature of that is that in many of, in all of these events, actually, our fellows are uh, at the center stage. So whether it is a New York Climate Week or uh, the UN Habitat uh, Conference. So uh, UN Habitat Conference Part 1 took place in the previous fellowship season. This time we are having another one with UN Habitat. For the next one, we are planning one with King's College London. And in all of these, uh, the fellows are speaking in panels. Uh, and we really think that that's a great way to learn by doing so. You know, if you're, uh, for example, speaking this month, uh, some of our fellows are going to be speaking on uh, the European Geoscience Union uh, conference. And uh, that's, uh, you know, uh, one of the larger environmental conferences that takes place in Europe. And uh, they're going to be speaking on frontier policies and technologies for <clears throat> life underwater. And 
the idea over there is that even if you're a person, even if you're a fellow who hasn't researched enough about life underwater earlier, uh, this will be your chance to not just research about it, but also to build, uh, you know, enough expertise, enough authority and enough, uh, you know, confidence to speak out in the public about some of these issues, which are really, really important. And these conferences are attended by, you know, some of the top people in the world. Uh, you know, in fact, for our UN Habitat conference, we had, uh, you know, uh, senior uh, British bureaucrats, Indian bureaucrats, parliamentarians, etc. attending uh, the event. So these are the places where you get to be in the front line and you get to be, uh, you get to have the spotlight and talk about some of these issues that matter to you. Uh, the, the thing that we are in talks with, uh, with King's College uh, London is, again, a very innovative sort of a format where we come together and we think about, uh, you know, we are going to get futurists, we are going to uh, get, you know, sci-fi writers, etc., along with uh, our fellows, King's College students and professors, and imagine what could be, you know, the craziest climate or security catastrophes of the future. That's going to be one hour, and then there's uh, the second hour is going to be about what could be the craziest or the most innovative solutions uh, to combat some of those, uh, you know, crazy catastrophes. So those are the kind of brainstorming sessions uh, that we also uh, engage in during our fellowship. So, so while, while we're still awaiting questions from the audiences and at any point in time, please now also feel free to unmute yourself because we'll be joined by Her Excellency in about 10 minutes time. Let me also give you a little uh, background about whether you can do this or not. Because again, a very common question that we get is, how do I manage this with a, with, with having a full-time job, or how do I manage this with, with having to graduate in three months' time? I'll have exams, and that sort of a thing. It should, so usually the way we structure our weeks during the fellowship is that we do not have more than six, we have between six to 10 hours of these sessions. So that those could be uh, the courses or the mentorship sessions or the office hours. Uh, and that's how we usually figure it out. It's also, uh, taught asynchronously so everything's recorded except for the office hours so that you have your privacy when you're discussing your future life with the mentors but uh, everything else is recorded so even if you could not attend a lecture today you could go back home and 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 uh, watch the lecture online later the recordings of, of the lecture uh, in case you haven't been able to attend the lecture we also encourage you to send us questions that you might have for the mentor or for the uh, for the person taking that discussion so that we could forward those and uh, he or she could address those during the recording of the lecture. Uh, and those are some of the things. Now, there are two other things that I wanted to mention before we address the questions. And, and I see that we have a couple of uh, comments in the chat box, which we will be uh, uh, addressing. Now, one is that we also have this very innovative concept of having a virtual cafe, uh, mm -hmm. which is where uh, which is basically fellows having a 24 seven zoom link, uh, which they can just log into and find other fellows from this cohort or the last or the future cohorts, hopefully. Uh, and you can just have a coffee or a drink and have a conversation about that, <coughs> about something that you might be interested in, about something that could be common for the both of you or about something that both of you dislike together. So that's also a relationship building, network building exercise that we want all of our fellows to undertake and we encourage it, uh, almost in all of the sessions that we do undertake. Uh, so that's another thing. And then finally about how do you graduate? So we've covered who can become a fellow, how do you become a fellow, uh, which is by logging onto our website, applying for it, uploading your resume and your statement of purpose, a letter of recommendation if you have one, uh, and then sit back and relax and see, uh, and we'll get back with you to you with the decision. But once you have gotten uh, through the fellowship and you've covered all of these courses and, and uh, uh, mentorship lectures, how do you graduate? So we encourage all of our fellows, the only graduating requirement we have is the capstone project. What is a capstone project? It is basically, uh, I can hear myself, I'd request everyone to uh, uh, mute themselves for now. Uh, a capstone project is basically a five to seven page document that you prepared on something that you have taken from this fellowship. So it could be from one of the mentor discussions, it could be from one of our lectures, it could be from one of the talks that you had in an office hour or 
a virtual cafe that is tangentially, even if so, related to sustainability policy or diplomacy, and you write about it. And the idea is for all of you, each of our fellows, to have one publishable product in your hand when you graduate. So this would not just add to your academic and professional profile, but also establish you, uh, in addition to having you speak at all of these conferences, which we do, establish you as an expert in whatever you have written about. So some of the past uh, capstone projects have been on uh, indigenous beekeeping, on uh, revamping the waste management systems of the world. And, and those are just some of them. Those are uh, some that spring to my mind, but uh, that is also an important aspect of, uh, of the fellowship. Right. Uh, let me just quickly take up a few of the questions that I'm seeing in the chat box over here. I see one question by uh, Amadio Baltasar. Uh, I don't know if I have pronounced your name correctly, Amadio. Uh, so, Amadio hello. is... Hello. How are you? Yes. I'm good. Thank you so much. Um, Amadeo is actually... Um, Amadeo. All right. <laughs> like the musician. Uh, yes, I have a question because I received one of your emails last night around 1 a.m. and mm -hmm. I still read it and I log in, I register, but I didn't read it completely, but I saw some fee about it. Right. And okay. it would be the first time that I'm taking a fellowship. So correct me if I'm mistaken. Um, I always thought fellowship would be like a, a mix between work and an internship. Um, mm -hmm. But this more like a actual classes that then like a course itself. Right. In fact, uh... Amadeo, fellowships, they come in various shapes and sizes, right? Okay. And uh, this particular fellowship, you can almost think of it as <coughs> a condensed uh, MPA, MPP program of sorts. Uh, but at the same time, it's a lot more flexible than that. And the work aspect comes through the capstone project that Ishan was just talking about, because this time, not only we are uh, allowing our fellows to do capstones on uh, a topic that they are passionate about. We are also going to be giving them a menu of options from a number of organizations who come to us with uh, a number of projects and they would love for, uh, you know, a group of young professionals to be working on them. So these are the problem statements that the organizations would be giving and you'll be more or less working with those organizations with mentorship and support and handholding from us uh, to make those projects work. So it's, it's uh, you know, a mix of uh, all of these lectures, all of these uh, interactive sessions, along with, uh, you know, uh, some of these projects. So that's one. About your question about uh, the fellowship fee, yes, the fellowship comes with uh, a fee, but then if you compare it with uh, something which is, uh, you know, a full-fledged MPA program, it is absolutely minuscule. Uh, mm -hmm. We do offer partial scholarships. Uh, the scholarships... Uh, we, we rarely give anybody a full scholarship. It has uh, rarely, rarely happened. And it's a whole admissions committee that takes that decision. And typically, you know, we give partial scholarships that would range from 15% to 30% of the fellowship fee. Okay. <laughs> and that, that also depends on the quality of the application, right? Of course. The last two questions I have, uh, probably everyone has a similar question is the, so I live in New York. Right now is almost 10 in the morning. So yep. this is going to be online. So, but what is the schedule? What's the time right. that will be? Because I'm also working during the day. And yep. the second one is how much is the entire fellowship, the application fee and everything else? Sure. Uh, so the exact amount of the application fee would be on the website, but then I think in US dollar terms, it's around $1,300, $1,350. Uh, yes. Is that right, Ishan? It's around $1,300. Yes, that's the yeah. whole of the fellowship fees. Yeah. Uh, and about your uh, schedule that you're asking about, Amadeo, we, what, so we've, one of our greatest strengths is our fellow fellowship cohort uh, joining in from the east to the west. And we do design classes in a way that uh, everyone is able to attend. And I know it's a, it's a bit of a challenge for everyone, but we have a bunch of fellows who have participated in the fellowship from New York. And I'd, I'd be happy to forward their contact details to you uh, yeah. and you can have a word with them as well. But usually for, for New Yorkers, and, and I consider myself a New Yorker because I've stayed there for quite some time. So for most of us, uh, the time is, is either early morning or late evening. 
so that would be around between 7 to 10 a.m or uh, between 8 to 12 p.m but again it depends on the mentor lecture because there are times when mentors themselves are joining us from new york so it's a lot more convenient for you there are times are joining us from jakarta uh, and then we just have to adhere to their time zone so we have mm -hmm. to make make those uh, 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 adjustments but everything is recorded uh, so but that's typically why, yeah typically if i were to just add to what ishan said you'd find about eight to 10 hours of engagement during a week. We keep Saturdays a little heavier because most of our fellows are working professionals. Most of our mentors are also working. So uh, all of our mentors are actually uh, working. So, uh, you know, they have to uh, adjust according to their hours in the office. And uh, our fellows likewise, uh, you know, most of our fellows would come from, uh, you know, uh, the US and India uh, and also in Europe. and that time uh, you know around this time where you're at is uh, kind of the sweet spot and you'll probably have a two-hour lecture on uh, you know a typical week would look something like this that you'd have a two-hour lecture on monday you'd have a two-hour engagement on wednesday two hour on thursday and either two or four hours on a saturday so that's that's broadly okay. how it is yeah thank you mm -hmm. <clears throat> so uh if uh, those are most of the questions. Again, time it's great questions, Amadeo, and I'm glad you brought it up because I'd actually made a note of talking about the time zones, but uh, it absolutely slipped my mind. So thank you for bringing that up. Uh, and uh, uh, if there are any further questions, please feel free to ask us. We'll also be joined by Her Excellency uh, in uh, a few minutes, I think. Yeah. I'm here. Oh, oh she's here. Oh. All right. Hello, Your Excellency. How are you? So good to be meeting you now in person. Hello. Not in person, but then at least face to face. Hello, Arpit. Um, I'm Maria. You can you can uh, call me Maria. That's easier for, for you and for me. Uh, and I'm delighted to be here with all of you. Uh, big group. You've made me work a lot over the weekend. <laughs> <laughs> so here I am. Well, uh, thank you so much, Maria, for taking out the time for this. And uh, uh, we, we would make sure that the Q&A are engaging enough so that uh, your work on the weekend uh, was not to a waste. Uh, and thank you so much for taking out the time. Uh, let me first uh, introduce Her Excellency more formally to the audience. Uh, <clears throat> uh, Her Excellency, Ms. Uh, Maria uh, <clears throat> Basols Delgado is the Deputy Permanent Representative of Spain to the United Nations. Uh, she graduated in Law and Business Sciences from ICADE and entered her diplomatic career in 1985. Uh, she has been assigned to the Spanish diplomatic representations in Poland and the United States. She was an advisory member in the cabinet of the Secretary of State for International Cooperation and for Ibero America, Deputy Director General of Multilateral Economic Relations, and Air Maritime and Land Cooperation. Uh, she was a head of technical cabinet of the Secretary General for Foreign Affairs and Deputy Director General in the General Inspection of Services. <clears throat> in August 2007, she was the ambassador in the Special Mission for Humanitarian and Social Affairs. And from January 2009 to March 2011, she was an ambassador in the Special Mission for Migratory Affairs. Uh, ambassador Delgado, uh, we welcome you to uh, this open lecture at the GPOTS Fellowship. And today we are going to be talking about uh, humanitarian action, peacekeeping, and sustainability. And we are looking forward to hearing from you. And again, a big thank you for taking out the time for us. Thank you, Arpit, and, and thank you for having me. Uh, it's, uh, it's funny how uh, coming to this uh, place where I am in New York and the new responsibilities gives you a, a bird eye view of everything that's happening in the world. Uh, my my uh, lecture today, if you can call it that, uh, is going to be divided into three sort of blocks. The first one, I want to talk to all of you on multilateralism. Uh, and the second, the second one will deal with peacekeeping. And finally, I will go into human rights. So um, there's no PowerPoint, no time for me to do a PowerPoint. Uh, but I hope that what uh, the, the reflections I make uh, give you a little bit of a taste of how we see the world sitting here in New York and every day uh, with our fellow uh, diplomats, uh, 192 other countries 
that are here with us. So let me start with multilateralism. Look, I'm going to say something that's very obvious, but I think we need to say it. Um, we live in a multipolar world, uh, a world where sovereign countries face, all of us face similar challenges, global challenges, where many of us have to suffer the global assertive, assertiveness of a few countries uh, and must accommodate all of us uh, to our own very often very complex realities. Finally, um, we all have to live with the inescapable reality that none of these global challenges that we face can be solved individually. Furthermore, we live in an interconnected multipolar world of global challenges and aspirations, as well as conflicts. We live in a world where we have new and protracted conflicts, national and regional conflicts, and all of them, and many of them, have ripple effects across the globe and are a menace to peace and security. None of these conflicts will find adequate and most importantly, lasting solutions away from the negotiating tables, away from diplomacy. Most of these diplomatic efforts will be carried out in a multilateral for fora. So some in this, in this setting, some say multilateralism is in crisis. I say, let's not forget what the world looked like when multilateralism was not there on a global scale. Europe knows too well how this looked like. It looked like war, incessant war, I would say, small wars between regions, medium wars between countries, bigger wars about, uh, amongst alliances, and then World War II and World War uh, I before that to really drive the message home. It also looked like stunted growth. It looked like lack of progress. It looked like lack of trust. We learned multilateralism and cooperation the hard way. A part of Europe uh, set out to, in a new path, in a new path to build that trust, to reconstruct economies, to ensure progress, first among 600 countries in 1957. And then slowly other countries added on to 10, 12, and 15 countries. And nowadays we are 27. A little before we started this exercise in 1948, United Nations drew its first breath and its, and its subsequent strength from the UN Charter. And then it, it went on to uh, agree on a Charter for Human Rights in 1948. We will be celebrating uh, its 75th anniversary next year. So if for the sake of argument, uh, multilateralism were in crisis, should and the question is, should international organizations disappear in favor of national sovereign states acting alone or on a me first basis, basically looking after their own interests in the uh, 21st century? In my view, there is no viable alternative to multilateralism. What we need to do and what we must do is demonstrate that we can reform and that we can adapt international institutions or organizations as needed. And some that we can make them fit to tackle the problems as we see them and as they come and to resolve them through international cooperation and dialogue. Now, we sometimes we forget that international organizations such as the UN are not extraterrestrial entities. They are the brain children of member states, of us, we created them with a vision. Much of the vision is to facilitate exchanges, to debate, to dialogue, to resolve issues through negotiation, and if possible, by consensus, because agreements by consensus ensure always a peaceful, uh, a peaceful way forward and frequently benefit for all, uh, benefits for all signatories. Member states can and should reform inter intergovernmental in uh, organizations, in international organizations, to ensure that tangible and measurable results are there and that we are the ones, and so we are the ones that have to be up to the task. 
multilateralism matters because multilateralism works. And sometimes we have a tendency to forget, especially here at the UN, where, where we are very critical of things that don't work, uh, how the many things that have been done in the past 75 years, decolonization, an end to apartheid, human right treaties, international humanitarian law, principles and values and rights that we have incorporated into our own national, uh, national norms and constitutions, conflict prevention measures, confidence, confidence building measures, uh, you know, and then long, et cetera. We only need to look at the 2030 agenda, and, and I'll talk about that agenda a little bit later, uh, to see what we have been capable of doing. And diplomacy, in all its variations, economic diplomacy, cultural diplomacy, climate diplomacy, security diplomacy, geopolitical diplomacy, has been and still is the greatest toolkit we have at our disposal. Now, what I've seen during these past four years here is that in some places of the world, individuals question the capacity of international organizations such as the UN to solve what they consider to be their real problems and what most certainly are their real problems. The need to put food on the table, to educate their children, to drink clean uh, water, to access jobs and have a future in the labor market, to put a roof over their heads, to access treatments for their treatment for the sick, to survive and endure floods, floods, desertification, rising temperatures. These, these are the real problems, which uh, COVID-19 has, in our view, significantly, significantly exacerbated. Extreme poverty after COVID-19 is back to levels we have never seen before in our generation. 700 million people suffer extreme poverty, which means they live under $1.9 a day. And uh, COVID-19, we foresee, will, for, will condemn another 70 million into this terrible reality. So sadly, this inequality gap is uh, widening and uh, especially is, and hits especially uh, the low income countries and the most vulnerable countries. So these people that question the UN and similar international organizations, uh, you know, they ask themselves, why worry about COVID-19 when we are on the border of dying hungry? Uh, when, when you don't have everything you need to make and means, why worry about world peace when things can always get worse? And, and they do, and they do, and very frequently they do. When conflict knocks at your door and upends your world forever, forcing you to flee, never to return to your village, to your town, to your friends, to your family, you know, the rest doesn't really matter. Forced displacement, and I was looking at these at this, uh, these numbers over the weekend is an everyday reality which will reach, if we are not careful, uh, over 80 million people's, people in 2021. So th the UN, in my view, and us, the member states who work in, uh, in, here uh, at the UN, must face up to these doubts and they must treat them as an opportunity. I would even say as an obligation to do a better job, to redouble the effort. And here's some of the things that I was thinking over the weekend that we need to concentrate and we actually concentrate on. First, making the UN fit for purpose through innovation, through innovation. Not only innovation through technology, but also, also through innovative programs, innovative methods of delivery of those programs, um, inno a, a reaching out to all the people to offer multifaceted solutions. This is not, we can't think that one solution will fit everybody. Innovation also in higher degrees of accountability, of transparency, of efficiency of what we do. Second, build new partnerships. 
Yes, international organizations are usually intergovernmental organizations, but the challenges we all face are neither simple nor necessarily solvable by states alone. And, and so we must bring in, in numerous areas, non-state actors that actually have, have nowadays very relevant roles in those areas. Solutions that work and withstand the test of time require strong partnerships that have to include civil society, NGOs, enterprises, businesses, youth. Youth is now being included almost everywhere. Women, the other half of the world population, and not just governments. Uh, and I would even say think tanks and academia. I would add that uh, on. And third, communicate better with the general public. You know, the European Union, which has undergone Brexit, uh, has very wisely uh, planned to reinforce this area and is very, very near to opening up to the public a two-year grass, uh, grassroots debate on the future of Europe. Uh, and this program will allow all citizens to express their views during their time period, this time period, two years. And as a result, we will need to build into the future work uh, of both the European Parliament, the Commission and the Council of the European Union, what that input, that very rich input that we will be getting. So uh, international organizations need to do better. And they need to disseminate not only information on disasters, but also success stories where what we did was well done and where a hunger and malnutrition have given way to small patches of land tended by rural families, where energy has stopped depending on chance and is guaranteed by so solar panels, where education and health uh, care reaches, finally reaches rural and urban areas uh, in a higher percentage, the success stories. So there's really no alternative in my view to multilateralism because as our Spanish, at that time, Spanish uh, Minister for Foreign Affairs and nowadays High Representative and Vice President of the European Union, Mr. Josep Borrell wrote, he wrote in an op-ed back in December, 2018, and I quote, global problems cannot be managed from the standpoint of local myopia. So this is uh, what my thoughts are on multilateralism. Now let me, let, and diplomacy. Let me now uh, turn to, to conflicts and, and peacekeeping. As I said in my, in, at the beginning, the, the, 11, the uh, 21st century uh, continues to serve us with what we call here at the UN traditional protracted conflicts, Syria, Yemen, Middle East peace process, et cetera, but also with newer conflict uh, and more complex conflicts. The growing geopolitical uh, rift between mates and the dysfunctions in their relationship often, often trigger and prolong these conflicts. So last year, uh, while we were at the very beginning of the pandemic, as we uh, stopped coming to meetings uh, here at the UN, uh, the UN Secretary General, Mr. Guterres, called for a global ceasefire. And actually a partial response came uh, and materialized in Libya, in the Ukraine, in Syria, Sudan, etc. cetera. Uh, but fighting has still continued in other places and has even picked up now in 2021, and new conflicts have appeared. Um, the root ca causes of these conflicts are not new. They're legion and very diverse. In, in general, it's about the economy, cultural differences, land disputes, but more and more in the past decades, it has also been about raging climate change, about water disputes, about a collapsing biodiversity, about xenophobia, about ethnic rivalry, about terrorism and nuclear proliferation, just to mention a few. And I would like to stop just for a minute and on one of these root uh, causes climate change and environmental degradation. I call it the great leveler because this, this, this root cause knows no borders, no boundaries and no beliefs. And it affects us all. And for some countries, the small island developing countries, 
this is an existential threat. And they say this very often here at the UN when they take the floor. Numerous conflicts have been linked to exploitation of natural resources, timber, gold, oil, um, diamonds, minerals, rare minerals. They're all at the heart of this. I looked at the la latest United Nations Environmental Program report. It's called Making Peace with Nature. And it's a, it's a report that one needs to read. And in that report, it said that 2,500 conflicts were linked to fossil fuels, water, food, and land, and are currently occurring across the planet. It's a very big number. Land degradation, water crisis, water scarcity, all of these put together cause environmental migration for many, many people. Uh, in other parts of the world, they are, people are, are, are uh, experiencing threats and expulsions from their land just to have those lands free for mining, uh, for industrial logging, for exports, etc. So if the UN was, and it was built to ensure and sustain peace, um, you know, when you looked and when you look at the UN Charter, all these uh, root causes are, are not there. Not even the, the, the there, there's not even a mention to peacekeeping in the UN Charter. So the UN Charter really does not offer any guidance as to this form of collective action. The UN peacekeeping history, and I was going through it over the weekend, is full of lights and full of shadows. It's some success and many failures. Uh, as it sought to provide security and peace all over the world. Dak Hammarskjöld, whom you I'm sure remember, he was one of the first secretary generals of this uh, institution, uh, was probably the secretary general that dared to fill better the gap between the charter and traditional diplomacy and did a lot of shuttle diplomacy back and forth. In fact, he, he died doing uh, shuttle dip diplomacy in the 60s. This role after Dag uh, passed away was very much cur curtailed uh, during the Cold War. I mean, uh, the two major powers were the ones to decide in reality about war. Uh, but uh, subsequent um, secretary generals, uh, without wanting to play politics, played an important role in settling disputes. And they armed themselves with special envoys and special representatives to help them, help them do this. And actually we have an enormous number of special envoys and special representatives of the secretary general uh, doing this uh, job all over the world. Now, peacekeeping, peace enforcement and peace building are, are what I call the three sides of a 3D coin. Uh, it's a very thin borderline that uh, you know divides peacekeeping from peace enforcement. Uh, it is very difficult objectively to keep to impartiality and neutrality and the soft stance that characterizes peacekeeping uh, when peacekeeping troops themselves are being targeted and attacked. So um, sustaining peace nowadays uh, involves more than ever the need to act in three uh, stages of the conflict pre-conflict, during conflict, and post-conflict. Preventive diplomacy, pre-conflict diplomacy is crucial. And it is at the center of what Secretary General Guterres uh, has um, developed as his broad vision for this agenda. One of the first deployment uh, of peacekeeping forces as a preventive measure was on PREPDEP, uh, a peacekeeping operation that's almost lost in time in, the, in 1995, uh, when uh, peacekeeping forces were deployed uh, with the task to patrolling, of patrolling Macedonia's border with Serbia. So conflict pre prevention uh, has been used in the past and continues to be used, uh, but it entails a very big capacity to recognize, analyze, and deal with the root causes. This is why it's preventive diplomacy. Uh, just the other day, I was looking at the news and OCHA, as you know, the humanitarian 
uh, or agency of the United Nations expressed its concern publicly for new and catastrophic drought and water shortages in Somalia, a country where tensions are already high due to a political crisis at the end of the uh, present president's uh, mandate, and also at the because of lacked program general elections. But furthermore, tensions have kept rising in this country because of the attacks of terrorist group Al-Shabaab Al near the capital. So there you have a triple a situation where triple forces, the drought, the water shortages, and the political forces and the terrorist forces uh, are, you know, sort of making up a perfect, a perfect storm. Conflict prevention also entails the capacity to mediate, to negotiate. And this is something that I wanted to say very clearly. Conflict resolution requires political solutions. And political solutions are a very comprehensive process in which diplomacy really plays a, a pivotal role because sustainable peace, and I want to underline sustainable peace, cannot be achieved unless all parties agree and unless all agreements are rooted in national and regional partnerships. And there's one more ingredient that I want to add on to this equation. A peace, peace and post-conflict rebuilding cannot take hold and will not take hold if one half of the population of any given country is not sitting at the table. If women are not seated at the negotiating table and are not accorded uh, a say in those peace agreements. UN mission mandates for peacekeeping and for political missions are important. They should be well crafted. They should have clarity in the mandates. They should consider, consider what we do in the short term, yes, but also medium and long term. And they should also consider a way out after peace is there and post uh, and peace building has begun, how to bring back the keys, peacekeeping forces. We have many peacekeeping operations uh, right now. Uh, I think the total was 14 uh, peacekeeping operations active today. But we must remember that they're not an end in itself. They are a means to an end. And the, there is a cycle to promote, and a cycle after peacekeeping has reached a positive conclusion to promote peace building and post-conflict reconstruction that is already a very important part of what needs to be done. Two more words about peacekeeping because I think that uh, I want to, to share with you a, a very recent action that uh, Guterres has, uh, has put on the table for, uh, and that all member states have agreed to by consensus. Um, the Secretary General Guterres uh, went public last year uh, with a document called Action for Peacekeeping. It's a declaration, we all signed it, and it's a commitment to, uh, based on his vision, to deliver uh, a management reform destined to make uh, peacekeeping uh, better and more efficient. Um, this Action for Peacekeeping uh, is still going on and valid today. He put it on the table three years ago. But in order to reinforce this document, uh, Guterres just a few days ago um, reinforced it by, um, with a new document, a, a, a Action for Peace Building Plus. Uh, it, was, it happened last March. And there, the two main ideas that I wanted to underline was that he found, that Guterres found a need to again reinforce the primacy of politics for the resolution of, con of, of conflicts and the search for durable solutions that are needed to sustain peace. And the second idea that he, fought, he thought he needed to reinforce was the need for the UN troops to, to perform better on the ground. Uh, and, and for us member states to provide them better, for, to have them better equipped, better trained, uh, to ensure less loss of life. 
so um, these are some of the ideas uh, that I uh, thought about this weekend when thinking about peacekeeping. Now, turning finally to human rights, um, human rights are at the very core of the values and principles that we believe in and that we seek to protect uh, through preventive political dialogue, through peacekeeping operations themselves, and, and most assuredly, through post-conflict rebuilding uh, of countries that have been in conflict. 75 years ago, the charter, the UN charter uh, reaffirmed, and I quote, its faith in fundamental rights, in the dignity and worth of the human person, in the equal rights of men and women. And three years later in 1948, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights defined those rights more fully. Uh, over the ensuing decades up until today, massive gains have been made in, in human rights. Uh, and the Secretary General very recently, and I was sitting at the, uh, at the General Assembly Hall when he, when he said this, recalled that billions of people live safer, longer, and more dignified lives today. We have covenants spelling out the full range of civil, political, social, economic, cultural rights. There is nowadays a robust treaty-based system in work and an institutional architecture for the promotion and protection of, of, of human rights. And the result has been a common vision by all nations as, and, and, a, and a set of rights that uh, are now are, are at once at, in the same uh, uh, vision, universal and indivisible. So why talk about human rights when if, if the story is so successful? We need to talk about human rights and still have them every day here in our work uh, at, the, at the core of what we do because human rights continue to face major challenges. And no country is immune to this. Uh, there's no need to pinpoint countries because there's always better to do in each of our countries, including mine, Spain. Sp uh, human rights have been steadily facing pressures, and I would even say rising pressure, pressures before the, the pandemic. Uh, and they continue to do so uh, now during the pandemic, even more so, and will continue to do so in the, in, in the next years. I mean, during the pandemic and before the pandemic, the rule of law has, and it continues to be challenged. There are repressive political systems that infringe on basic freedoms and basic rights. There's little accountability for atrocity crimes, women, girls, minorities, LGTB, LGTBI people are confronted with chronic discrimination and violence racism and xenophobia are on the rise and a very long etc. Guterres, uh, the past uh, two weeks when I was at the General Hall Assembly, underlined that COVID has even triggered another human rights crisis of its own, the limitation of civic space and work of journalists and human rights defenders. He further pointed out that in his view, the greatest human rights challenge during COVID has been gender, gender equality, gender-based violence at home, gender uh, job losses, women jo lost more jobs than men, child marriage has gone up, sexual exploitation has gone up, the loss of education for many women and many girls who had no access to internet. So, you know, with COVID, we've seen areas that we thought were a little bit more controlled uh, and, and well, uh, you know, and, and, and well into being resolved, uh, slip back. This is why uh, the uh, Secretary General, February 2020, made a call to action on human rights. And, and he delivered this call to action and renewed it uh, two weeks ago in March. Uh, and he clearly stated the need to renew the first bond derived from the Charter of Human Rights, from that charter that we all approved in 
48. Uh, so as we continue to fight to attain all civil, political, economic, social, cultural rights, several areas continue to warrant an extra effort. Now, when the Secretary General um, set out uh, in this call to action, he, the, the most recent one, when he again went back to the call to action that he delivered last year and renewed it uh, two or three weeks ago, uh, he reflected on what were the difficulties and what are the difficulties, but he set out 11 principles, I'm not going to go through them, um, that I thought were very important to guide our way forward. And out of those 11 principles, I'd like to stop just very briefly on four. First, he, does, he underlined quite a number of times that human rights are universal and indivisible. Why? Because human rights are, are being subjected nowadays to three things. Alternative narratives. Some have said there's a difference between the right to development and the civil and political uh, human rights and the defense of the primacy of relations between states versus those who place the person in the center of human rights. Two, they're being subjected to alternative concepts. So we find that concepts that were never in this in the Charter of Human Rights are slowly creeping into uh, the human rights arena. For example, mutually beneficial cooperation. That's a new concept. And three, they're being subjected to a sort of hierarchy. So during uh, the uh, Trump administration in the US, the Commission of Inalienable Rights was created. Now it has been uh, canceled. Uh, and this meant that some rights were inalienable and some rights were not. So there has been a push by certain countries to establish a difference inside this whole corpus of uh, human rights. One of these of those countries, uh, very uh, interestingly, established uh, the importance of finding an equilibrium between universality and specificity in human rights. And, uh, and went on to say, some human rights, and I quote, some human rights such as peace, development, justice, equity, democracy, and freedom are common values for all humanity. And some human rights uh, are, are specific because, and I quote, countries differ in their history, culture, social systems, level of social and, uh, and uh, economic development, uh, which calls for protection of human rights informed by national reality of each country and the needs of its population. These quotes come from uh, Minister Wang Yi himself, the Minister of Foreign Affairs of China, uh, in a session of the Council of Human Rights in February 2021 in Geneva. And a further quote uh, also illustrates what I'm trying to convey. Uh, and the quote goes like this, uh, open quotation marks, um, human rights are not the monopoly of a small number of countries. And in any case, should not be used as a tool to pressure other countries and intervene in matters related to the domestic jurisdiction of states. So this is the uh, this is what we're dealing with here uh, that undermines the universality and indivisibility of human rights as the charter intended. And the, the, the other three principles very, very graphic, you know, very telegraphically are that I thought uh, the Guterres underline and are interesting because it conveys where uh, what are his concerns are the following. Human diversity is an asset. He thought he needed to say that. Human diversity is an asset, an asset and not a threat. Two, climate change is the biggest threat uh, to our survival as a species. And three, human rights are anchored in national ownership, yes, but linked globally. 
They require broad and sustained engagement within states, civil society, and other stakeholders. So he, need, he, need, he thought he needed to say that, and this gives you a taste of where the problems lie and the work we need to do moving forward. Just one last, very last uh, point about uh, Agenda 2030. I told you at the beginning I would refer to it, and I want to refer to it because Agenda 2030, that is, is, a, is a document, we, all member states, 193 member states, passed and approved by consensus in 2015. And it has 17 sustainable development goals, 169 targets, and more than 5,350 uh, 5, actions. And they all concern, you know, deal with human rights, sustainable development, conflict, conflict prevention, et cetera. In, in sum, it's our blueprint for the next decade. And, and this uh, agenda, uh, which is an agenda for all countries, Spain has its own national plan to develop this agenda at home. This agenda concerns all of us because if we manage by 2030, and we're late already doing that, if we manage by uh, 2030 to really push forward in this agenda and all 17 of its development goals, the world would be transformed, completely transformed. And, and I think that we uh, were on track not as much as we wanted to before COVID-19, now we're not on track. Now COVID-19 has raised the bar and we need to accelerate very, very uh, much in order to, to complete uh, the agenda by 2030. I don't know if I had time, Arpit, to just touch on two things, uh, COVID-19, do I have time? Certainly, certainly. Uh, we, we do have a number of questions lined up, but then I will cut down on my questions. Uh, but okay. I, I have at least one that I need to ask you after this. But yeah. Okay. So um, COVID-19 um, has stalled progress everywhere. Uh, we're not on track, as I said, as we were uh, before 2020. Uh, and it has added to a list of problems that I have pointed very, very, you know, very, um, uh, succinctly, uh, but it has added three problems that I wanted to, to put on the table. One, the need to end the pandemic through access to vaccines. It is very clear to us that equitable, efficient, and transparent access to vaccines, medical treatments, and therapeutics is a must, and it's a priority not only for the UN, and WHO, but also for us uh, countries, both developed countries and non-developed countries. We need to ramp up production. We need to reach an agreement to voluntarily and temporarily uh, put on hold intellectual property rights to the vaccine and make it available for production in other countries, et cetera. So this is one of the problems that we're dealing with here and in Geneva quite frequently and actually uh, it consumes, you would not believe it, it consumes a lot of our time and not in a lot of our meetings. Second, the economic problems. I mean, COVID-19, if, if there were economic problems before, COVID-19 has really uh, exacerbated those problems. And we now find ourselves with six countries in default. We find ourselves with uh, countries that are unable to pay their debt interest due to economies that have either slowed down or completely stalled. Um, there are significant liquidity problems in, in many economies. Uh, borrowing costs have gone up. I mean, it's, it's, it's a very dire uh, panorama out there. So some form of relief has already come. Debt moratoria and standstill agreements are there. Uh, the debt service suspension initiative, which was uh, which began in 2020, has been extended to the end of 2021, and my bet is that it's going to be extended to 2022. Uh, the IMF, after an enormous amount of discussions, has finally approved the transfer of 600 billion 
dollars in special drawing rights to most vulnerable countries. And but not to say not that doesn't mean that a new emission of special drawing rights is not needed and experts are looking at that. Um, but there's still lack of access to liquidity programs to facilitate market functioning. And uh, many, many are, ad are advocating for just outright debt cancellation uh, in order for low income countries and very vulnerable countries to be able to, um, you know, stand a little bit better on their own two feet uh, while they wait for uh, their usual uh, uh, money producing activities, tourism, commerce to come back. And finally, the last, the last uh, uh, issue I wanted to mention is climate change. I haven't talked in depth about that, but we need to be more ambitious. We need to be very much more ambitious before yep. the COP26 in Glasgow uh, starts next November. And this is what we're trying to do. Um, locally in, in my country, uh, but um, there are other countries also um, that, that need to uh, shoulder that weight and, and come back and um, come back, go to Glasgow with ambitious programs to reduce emissions. And I'll leave it at that and uh, start with your question if you want, Arpit. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Maria, if I may. And uh, no, my question is actually uh, regarding climate change, and that's uh, you know that also gives us some time to talk a lot more about the subject. But before I jump in the question, I have to uh, just say thank you and compliment you for one bit because this question comes up all the time. Uh, the you know uh, seemingly great debate about whether multilateral institutions uh, are of any good or uh, have they been uh, you know utterly uh, useless. And uh, thank you for, uh, you know, bringing in a balanced and reasoned perspective over here, where you say that, you know, when you look at certain things about, you know, peacekeeping, human rights, we have done a lot better than, you know, uh, what history has shown us before these multilateral institutions existed. Essentially, as you said, that Europe had been in a perpetual state of war before that. Uh, <clears throat> and so were many other parts of the world. Uh, but at the same time, you also admitted to the fact that there is uh, indeed a lot more innovation and reform needed. And uh, that is uh, perhaps the, uh, you know, most balanced and close to reality view that I've heard on this topic. So thank you uh, so much for that. Uh, my question to you is, uh, you know, regarding desertification. And, you know, uh, we know that as early as 1977 at the UN conference on desertification held in Nairobi, uh, <clears throat> We had maps of deserts uh, that were uh, drawn for, uh, you know, all across the world. And Spain was the only Western European country uh, that was included with a very high desertification rate in the entire, uh, you know, uh, European continent, especially the southeast of the peninsula. And since then, Spain has contributed immensely in, uh, you know, countering de desertification in Nigeria, Sudan, China, India, uh, Iran and Mongolia. Now, my question is that, again, uh, this is a sustainable development of climate change issue. De desertification eventually turns into a human rights issue because of lack of food, lack of water and essential human services. Now, what in your view uh, are some of the you know, uh, things that the world should be doing or the world should be coming together on? Uh, and what, what do you think are some of the, uh, you know, uh, best practices or recommendations or steps forward that we should take to solve this problem of desertification, which is a climate change as well as a human rights problem. And Thank big countries are big countries with big populations are suffering with this. Yes, they are. Uh, thank you very much for the question. It's a it's a it's a very interesting question. It's a question uh, which, you know, in this in this mission where I'm, I'm sitting, uh, we have counselors of all kinds and, and, and ex ex expertise. Uh, and we have a very, very good counselor on environmental issues. And this, as well as everything that is being done for Glasgow, et cetera, but desertification, water, water, water problems, these are all uh, things, issues which uh, he deals with, I would say on an everyday basis. 
I agree with you, and it's a very good question, is I agree with you that desertification not only has uh, immediate consequences on the land, uh, on the barrenness on the land, uh, et cetera, uh, it has very serious social and economic consequences. Um, it's, it's, it's not only, desertification is not only the result of lack of water. So let's be clear about that. It's also the result of overexploiting water when, and not yep. managing properly water. It's a result of unsustainable agricultural practices. It's a result of overgrazing places. It's a result of irrational urbanization. So the causes, sometimes when we think desertification, there's no water, no rain. No, there are other causes to that, so many other causes. And the UN Conference to Combat Des Desertification is one of the three big conventions uh, that resulted from the Rio Conference, um, you know, already identified that problem early on. As you say, in Europe, desertification and drought affected countries are mainly Spain, very prominently, but also Portugal. Mm -hmm. And also, also the southern areas of Greece, the southern areas of Italy, the southern areas of Cyprus, uh, the coastal, the coastal areas of Bulgaria and Romania. You know, in Spain, when we have these very hot summers, um, when I was young, uh, my family used to say, oh, we have Kalima. And I would, you know, Kalima, Kalima, I never knew what Kalima was. Well, <laughs> Kalima was the hot, very hot wind from the, des the Saharan desert. Uh -huh. that crossed the Strait of Gibraltar and came into the south of Spain and was responsible for temperatures rising to 40 degrees Celsius um, in half of our peninsula. So yeah, we have Kalima and the winds keep on coming from, 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 from Sahara. Um, policies. I don't know, you know, I can tell you what we have done yeah. to try to to stop this phenomenon. Uh, what we have done, and, and we have a long tradition of doing this uh, since the 19th century, first of all, is repopulate forests, plant trees. The more trees you plant, the, the, the uh, less desertification you may get. And, and, and not only repopulate forests, but also repopulate them with the kind of trees that are going to be staying and that do not contribute to the soil deg degradation. One of the uh, trees that we have repopulated part of Spain with are eucalyptus trees. Why? Mm -hmm. uh, up in the north. Why? Because those trees produced what was needed for chemical in for the chemical industry near uh, Asturias in, in Santander. But those are, are trees that contribute to soil degradation. So repopulate with the correct trees. Yeah. Then we have a, a very good pro, uh, project, and I was looking this up, uh, against desertification in the Mediterranean. So, you know, in the coastal areas. And it incorporates not only the concept of, of, of desertification, but what, what, we all always, but what we've done through this project is a map of degraded land due to desertification. And so once you have the map, you have the possibility, once you have the data, which is crucial, you have the possibility to put in the policies, to insert the policies that are needed in each area and build the institutions that are going to manage and oversee those policies. So we're, you know, this is not magic. This is a For lot that of context. Yeah. In that context. And, and that is a lot of work. We've also adopted a, a national plan against the certification. And this plan, uh, this plan, you know, looks at prevention, mitigation, sustainable development, et cetera, et cetera. And the last thing we've done, last April 8th, so last week, we passed the law on climate change and energy, which is part of our contribution to COP26. This is part of what we're doing to eliminate climate change adverse effects. And this law, as well as the plan on adaptation to climate change, have a very big, are very concentrated also on this desertification issue. So 
in short, if I had to sum up a recipe, uh, it would be, A, get your data, get your data, get your information, map out the area or the country, what's happening where. Two, uh, you know, look at the UN conventions and see what they're doing, but also look at what we're trying to do in climate change and apply the policies that are needed once you have the information. Forest trees, more trees, uh, better management of, of water, uh, whatever those waterways are, um, and not one size fits all policy. You need to differentiate uh, what you do in one part of your country and what you do in another part of your country, because you know desertification in our country has been hovering over the south of Spain since the Romans. I mean, years ago. Yeah. And we, if you go, you know, Romans were so, and I'll stop there because I can keep on going, but <laughs> Romans were so intelligent that they built aqueducts. And aqueducts were not mm -hmm. just a haphazard invention. They were an invention that carried water from point A to point B when plastics were not there and hoses were not there because yep. Yep. They saw the need for that and and manage irrigation manage agriculture those are those are um you know no-brainers when you try to tackle desertification certainly uh thank you so much for this very detailed response and uh we have uh probably uh, just eight minutes and uh, time to uh, maybe squeeze in two more questions and uh, one is coming from one of our fellows and one is coming from uh, one of our team members. So, uh, uh, KP, would you uh, quickly want to ask your question? And then uh, after that, it will be followed by a question from Dhriti. Yes. Uh, good morning, Your Excellency. Thank you so much for such an insightful and informative session. And I especially agree with the fact that we need to be more ambitious when it comes to our climate targets. Uh, and in furtherance of that, so my question is with respect to uh, your opinion on uh, the scope for cooperation between uh, India and Spain at a bilateral level and bilateral agreements in general in addition to uh, what is envisioned by multilateral agreements such as the Paris Agreement or even uh, agreements with the EU. And I was just, uh, I just wanted to know your opinion on uh, the scope of bilateral trade agreements in uh, with respect to climate change and energy specifically between India and Spain? Okay, that's really a good question, a very specific question. Huh? Um, I've lived in India, though I wasn't, uh, I wasn't working. Um, I, I, I married my husband who was ambassador to India. And so I went there and I had the luxury of, uh, of um, living and, there and, and seeing the country during four years and a half. A great country. I had a great time there, um, but a very diverse country. And I always thought that India was more a continent than a country, uh, because when you travel through that country, you see, you see what you see when you travel through Europe. No? Uh, in climate change, I think that your uh, that India is doing very well, uh, from what I've, uh, from what has been, I've been told doing very well and is very ambitious. Uh, President, uh, Prime Minister Modi is really ambitious uh, regarding climate change. But the, 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 the uh, how would I put this in, <laughs> the words come in Spanish. So excuse me for that. But India is such a big country uh, and uh, development is so different in one place and another that really to to reduce uh, its emission um, and to and to be able to reach its uh, goals in climate, uh, you need a whole of country policy. Now I think India is on track to exceeding its its renewable targets, it's, it's, it's targets in renewable energy. And I think that is exactly what it has to do. We have been doing the same thing. We have been uh, being very ambitious in reducing uh, fossil energy uh, through renewable energy, both solar or uh, wind energy. 
And this is what uh, India has been doing. So we are known in Spain uh, for very good enterprises, very good businesses that have developed renewable energy alternatives. Uh, and, and one of the things that I would point to is the need to make that cooperation closer. More than agreements, I would say, put into contact the enterprises that are good at this and that have already uh, uh, a past and that already have the data and the information needed to see what worked and what did not work. That is one of the things that our uh, mission in our embassy in India and, this, and more uh, concretely, our, our commercial office in, in India is trying to do. The second thing, and, and it was, it's very funny that, that you should mention it because the second thing is, is that there is a high level dialogue going to happen on energy that's going to happen in September, 2021. And it's, it's going to be the first global gathering on energy under the auspices of the, of the General Assembly. And it's going to present a historic opportunity pre-Glasgow, pre-COP26, uh, to provide transformational action um, in, in, in support of the Paris Agreement and especially in the field of energy. And it just turns out that both India and Spain, along with another seven countries, uh, are global champions of this high level uh, uh, dialogue on energy and are going to be working together on what we call theme two. And theme two is energy transition. How do you transition from fossil to renewable? And so they're working already closely together, developing ideas, initiatives to foster renewable energy, energy efficient and, and efficiency and, and decarbonization patterns. So this, these, these uh, we, we'll see what happens in, I will be able to tell you more, we'll see what happens in September. But it's, uh, it was a good uh, thing when I saw the, the <clears throat> nine countries that are working together to see that we were both together there and we may have uh, very similar recipes to get on with this energy transition that we need to accelerate so much. Mm -hmm. Thank, Thank you, you uh, so much, uh, Your Excellency. That was really uh, amazing to hear. And I will look forward to the conversation in September. Thank you so much, Your Excellency. Uh, if, if we may just squeeze in one quick question, uh, the last one from uh, Dhriti. Uh, Dhriti, are you here? Would you uh, like to ask your question by unmuting yourself? All right, so in, in, uh, in that case, if Dhriti isn't here anymore, then Anna from uh, the audience, uh, she had a question. So uh, Anna, would you like to unmute yourself quickly and then ask your question, please? Um, hello, my name is Anna. I'm from Romania. Um, I have to say that, um, first of all, uh, Your Excellency, thank you very much for your presence today with us here. Uh, thank you to, uh, to the organizers for the event. It, it's uh, been very helpful, very enlightening to say so. Um, and I look forward to seeing more from you guys in the future. Um, concerning the um, human rights, I, I heard a lot about them and I've... Uh, I've read a lot about them, um, also written some papers on that. Uh, I, I'm very interested, uh, based on uh, this uh, whole COVID pandemics uh, situation, what exactly uh, will the UN, uh, how exactly will the UN ensure that the human rights will be respected in those areas where uh, um, they weren't uh, very much, uh, let's just say, uh, aware of them? once and then uh, they, they are they've been very affected by the COVID itself. They don't have access to vaccines, they don't have access to clean water and to all the other uh, facilities that uh, we do have. Uh, and uh, a secondary question if I may, uh, it's concerning um, uh, what exactly um, is the view over the private sector in getting involved and helping uh, the UN to uh, enforce their program and their programs for the people. And I'm not talking about the uh, think tanks or the NGOs, but I'm talking about companies from either technology in industry sectors, 
um, that's it and thank you very much. Both great questions, Anna. Happy to to be able to to say something about uh, both of them. Look, what what you mentioned about uh, areas that are very difficult to reach, I can't agree with you more. I mean, uh, human right protection in those areas are is extremely difficult. I mentioned at the very beginning uh, something that I really feel very deeply about. Um, in, in areas of conflict, in areas, in far-flung areas where access to water means two-mile walk uh, and then two-mile back to your house uh, to be able to drink water, it is very difficult to protect those human rights. And as I said, in a, part of my, my lecture at the beginning, uh, it, it's an incumbent about, uh, it is incumbent upon governments uh, to reach and, and their, all their population and ensure that human right protection. It is, for me, the, the most difficult part of this whole thing is in conflict situations, in areas that are uh, where there's a war going on, where guerrillas, where terrorism uh, are, uh, you know, are, are fighting. Uh, human right protection there is extremely difficult. And in COVID situations, it's even more difficult. So uh, my answer to you there is A, one of the most important things that Spain backs when we look at a oper uh, peacekeeping operation in, for, you know, to, to maintain peace during conflicts is including in those peace, in, amongst those peacekeepers, two new um, types of experts, experts on human mm -hmm. rights and experts on climate change, both of them. Yes. Experts on human rights, yes. because we want them to be our eyes during conflict and during the time that the peace uh, operation is functioning. Uh, experts on, on climate, because we want to uh, diminish the footprint of peacekeepers climate wise in those countries. So that is first part of the question. Second part of the question of the, of the answer. Second part of the answer is going to be, uh, what do we do in humanitarian situations? Very difficult. If, if OCHA, the humanitarian uh, agency, uh, delivering agency for the UN, if OCHA is able to access those areas, then we can be fairly sure that we are going to deliver and we are going to protect very basic human rights, the right to food, the right to health, access to health, etc. But I would say that the biggest deliverer of that kind of protection is the International Red Cross. That is the institution that has access and the access, the reputation to, to be guaranteed the access to these sort of situations, even during COVID-19. And they are the ones to be able to report back what is happening and if, if and what more is needed. Um, but, and I would like to close with this, this part of the question. Let's not forget, COVID-19 is in some parts of the world, the least of anybody's worries. First worry is keep your life and not be bombshelled the next day. Yep. Have access to food, have access to drinking water. That's the first order of things. When you look at the list of priorities, COVID-19 and the vaccine, way down there. Mm -hmm. So that is a big reality. Second, private uh, sector involvement. You know, the private sector is very excited to, to get involved in what we do here. There is uh, an, a, a program called the Global Compact the United Nations Global Compact uh, with a very able director who, what does she do in, in this, in this um, hesitate program, um, enterprises from the whole world can sign up and, 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 and see the programs and participate. Uh, Spain has the very high honor of having the most enterprises that have signed up to the Global Compact. We have 1,500 enterprises that have signed up and are willing 
to not only see what the UN is doing, but also provide answers and provide their time and provide programs. So uh, my, my view on private sector, on the private, private sector involvement uh, here at the UN is not only positive, but I would say that it would be, it is our obligation, and this is my very personal view as member states, to provide them with much more guidance than we have done up until now on what we need from them. You know, because uh, private enterprises are nowadays not only are not only happy with giving money for this or that project, they want to know where that money goes for for uh, for and how better to help and have a say. And mm -hmm. in my view, we need to open up that that to them that possibility because all their opinions since they have information on the ground all over the world, is going to enrich our views and our positions and our programs. Uh, and it's going to make them better. Mm -hmm. Thank, Thank you, Anna. You. Thank you very much. Muchas gracias. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ambassador, for taking out this time and for uh, this fascinating and open discussion on <clears throat> human rights, the environment, uh, international organizations. I think we've covered so much ground today that it's going to take us a while to digest all of this and probably watch this video over and over again. But uh, again, thank you for being so gracious with your time. Uh, I did not know that you have uh, lived in India. So maybe the next time uh, when COVID is over, you should visit us and give us a chance to host you uh, over here. And since you've traveled around much in India, maybe you could also show us around some place because it's such a huge country that nobody knows the whole uh, <laughs> country themselves. But uh, again, uh, we hope to stay in touch and engage with you in the future. And thank you so much once again for your time. Thank you. And let me just, uh, as I say goodbye, tell you that for me, it is always a pleasure. It's always a pleasure to uh, have a dialogue uh, with uh, young, uh, the younger generations. It is my absolutely, you know, absolute view uh, that, um, if, young, if the young generations are interested in these issues, we have a chance um, because the world is yours. It's not mine. I mean, I've been here working for a long time. So keep on, keep on learning and keep on being interested in all these issues. Uh, you're going to have to solve them better than we have in the future. Uh, and thank you, Arpit, for reaching out and for hosting me. It's been a pleasure and uh, have a great, end of the day, night, or morning. I have no idea. You're all over the world. <laughs> From all over the world right now. But well, you have a nice day ahead, Ambassador. Thank you so much. Thank you. And thank you, everybody. Have a nice day, evening, or morning, wherever you are. And please do engage with us in the future. Bye-bye. <laughs>